Uh, good morning. Thank you for coming out uh, to this uh, discussion. Uh, I'm Jeff Goldberg from The Atlantic, uh, and we're the four tops. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, my friend uh, John Donvan from ABC, who, does, uh, who moderates Intelligence Squared, always says that for whatever reason, moderators of panels always say, uh, our panel needs no introduction, and then they proceed to introduce them. Um, but our panel really needs no introduction. Um, Bob Kagan <laughs> is, uh, is uh, many of you know, one of America's leading foreign policy thinkers. That's fair, right? If you say so, <laughs> yeah, No, one of. You're one of moderator. is fair. One of. Um, Jim Steinberg uh, is a former Deputy Secretary of State and now um, the Supreme Leader of Syracuse University. Um, uh, Nick Burns, uh, next to me, is at Harvard now. He was uh, Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. Uh, so we're going to have, I think, a, a, a good discussion, and we're going to try to cover a lot of ground, all seven continents, if we can. <laughs> I'm going to start with Antarctica. Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, we're starting with Antarctica. Um, I wanted to uh, start big and then go to some specific problems. One of the things that, uh, that, that, uh, that you notice uh, in presidencies is that presidents come in, Bob and I were talking about this before, presidents come in with um, huge foreign policy goals, uh, huge, uh, huge notions about how the world should be organized, and then uh, succumb to events. Uh, succumb might be the wrong term, but, but their days are filled with crises, and crises in places that you would never have imagined when you come in as a president that you would, you would deal with. I'm sure the president didn't think he was going to be spending this much time on Syria. Um, but, but let's start with, uh, before we go to questions like Syria, let's start with uh, uh, a big subject, which is the subject of American decline, or whether America is in decline or not, uh, and if it is, what that would mean for the world. Um, Bob, you've written about this quite a bit, and I was hoping you could do two things quickly. One is frame the issue, and, and, and the second is tell us what you think about that the, the, the notion that we are in decline? Well, first of all, the president, as you know, has already answered this question. He said that anybody who thinks that we're in decline doesn't know what he's talking about. So, Jeff, I, hope, I don't know what side of that issue you want to be yeah. on. Yes. Um, but uh, look, I think that the discussion of decline, first of all, of course, we periodically go through this. One of my favorite quotations is from Patrick Henry in 1788, talking about how the United States had lost the vigor of its youth. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, this, it's, it's sort of in the DNA for us to be concerned, and I think in a way it's, it's healthy. But I think if you do any kind of honest measurement, um, uh, a sort of analytical uh, way of looking at it, I think America has not been in decline. And, and the, the key mistake that people make, in my view, is they have an imagination of about a mythical past when the United States could do whatever it wanted to do. I mean, you always say the United States can no longer do whatever it wants to do in the world. And my question is, when was that exactly? Uh, it well, wasn't. 1945 was about the top year, right? Well, yeah, it's been downhill ever yeah, since. Yeah, it's been downhill right? ever since we won World War II. No, but really, if you look at the 1940s, since you raised the 1940s, and that's the period when we had 50% of global GDP and everybody else was on their back, and, we, and the United States did some very successful things in Europe, notwithstanding the half of it that was controlled by the Soviet Union. But if you look at Asia, it was one calamity after another. Uh, the Chinese Revolution, which led almost immediately to the Korean War, uh, which didn't end particularly well. And so uh, what we need to remember is it's always difficult to exercise influence. You know, people say, well, I haven't, you know, we can't solve the Middle East peace problem. Well, when did we solve it? You know? And so we have to have a reasonable baseline. And to my mind, and this is true of this administration, uh, it's clear that the United States remains the most influential power in the world. And I think that even if people in this administration came to office thinking that the United States was really damaged goods, and I think to some extent they did, I think one of the things that they learned, and, and also one of the things that they repaired to some extent, but what they learned was everybody still looks to see what the United States is going to do. Uh, Jim, uh, argue with the premise if you want or, or not, but, but answer, uh, answer this question. Um, are, if we are in decline, what would it mean for our relationship with China and Russia, just for starters? Well, I think that is a good question, Jeff, because I think, I mean, objectively, I think Bob is exactly right. So the question is more, how, how do we perceive our role? Do we perceive ourselves in decline? And how does that affect the policy choices that we make if we think we're in decline and are sort of preparing for that future? And perhaps even more important, how do other people think about it? Because in some ways, um, the self-confidence that goes with the confidence of, 
uh, of leading. Even is, talking about the client is a sign is, of decline. It, it's a sign of decline, and it sends signals to others about how do you prepare yourself for a world in which the United States either is unwilling, either in, incapable or more important, unwilling to play the role of global leader. And I think that's what scares people, frankly, because the vacuum that comes from a U.S. retreat by choice or by lack of capacity really creates a lot of uncertainty in the world. The world, whether the United States, you know, is a hegemon or dominating the world, the world does need leadership. And when that withdraws, people begin to start hedging their bets, they begin to thinking about how do they protect themselves, and that creates a lot more conflict and a lot more uncertainty in the world. So what we see if the United States pull back was a lot of people trying to think, well, how do we protect ourselves? What, what will happen in that absence? Will China become a dominant power? Will there be more anarchy? Will there be more competition among middle-level powers? And that creates a lot of uncertainty. So that's why, for all the discussion, even the BRICS and everybody else, you don't really see a sense that they want the United States to, to, to step back. They, that, that uncertainty is as worrisome as, as a dominant U.S. role. But, I mean, if you, um, well, if you read the statements of uh, Mitt Romney on subjects like China and Russia, um, you'd think that they, they, they do want America to decline in, in influence. What would be the, um, what would be the impact uh, on, just take Asia for starters, uh, if America were actually in decline? If we decided that, you know what, we're not going to play the role that we've played for the last 60 years. Right. Um, I don't want to talk about decline because people who teach at Harvard leave that to people who teach at Yale. But having said that, um, that's an inside joke. Yeah. Um, having said that, I think we have it to. It was a good joke too, Thank by you. the way. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm glad you recognized it. No, I it. appreciated it as a joke. Um, yes. Having said that, um, I think we have to recognize that the relative power of the United States has declined relative to other powers in the world. Certainly, if you look at the partial rise of India, Brazil, China, to global economic, political, and military power. We can no longer um, write the script the way we did when we had 50% of the world's GDP back after the end of the Second World War. But having said that, if you think about metrics of power, the Maxwell School, the Kennedy School, political power, we're still the most influential country by a mile in the world. Military power, everyone knows that the United States has unassailable military power. Joe Nye, our colleague and friend, has talked about soft power. We, every country has it. We're probably number one, North Korea is probably 193, but we've got a lot of it. What I worry about is our economic strength and, and the inability of our two political parties to make common decisions about our future because our military political power rests on our economic power and, and of course that's in some question right now. That's what I worry about. I don't worry too much about China gaining on us or overtaking us. Uh, China doesn't have a single ally in the world. China has North, North Korea. Korea. North Korea, North Korea is a problem to have child. Burma. Yeah. But think They've of lost it. Burma. <laughs> think of it this way. And John Eikenberry, who teaches at Princeton, has has written a lot about this. The proper way to measure the strength of the United States versus China is to measure the U.S. alliance system versus China. What's the U.S. alliance system? It's Canada, 26 European members of NATO, and it's all of our treaty allies, including Japan, South Korea, Australia, the Philippines, Thailand, and countries that want to work with us: India, Vietnam. Singapore, that's a pretty awesome collection of countries, most democratic, some not. That's what the United States has going on. And the for. number one reason they want to be in alliance with us is to check China's power? Some of them in Southeast Asia certainly want that. I mean, Leon Panetta, our Secretary of Defense, was um, in Asia, in India and Southeast Asia three weeks ago, and he paid a visit to Cameron Bay. For those of us who remember the Vietnam War, how ironic is that? that the Vietnamese are inviting us back, our Navy, to Cameron Bay. So I think the United States ought to be the most powerful country in the world 50 years from today, and that's a good thing. But it's bigger than that, too, Jeff, because the, part of the reason they want to be allied with us is because they see that they can be allied with us without having to give up too much of their sovereignty. So that it's not like they are a satrapy or a dependency on the United States. It gives them the freedom to pursue their own things. There is a, an element of global goods that we're providing. There's a bit of free riding, too, but, but we, we get enough of a benefit from that free riding and creating that global order that nobody else can create. And when you talk about these di different rising powers, you have to differentiate among them. I do think that China and Russia would like a diminished American role, certainly in their regions. Right. Um, I don't think that's the way India feels. I don't even think that's really the way Brazil feels. And, you know, I, I guess I would disagree with Nick that the fact that India and Brazil are having economic success and are rising, I don't think that counts against American power. You know, when we talk about the rise of the rest today, the most impressive rise of the rest in history was the rise of Japan and Germany during, during the Cold War. 
Did that hurt or help the United States? And I think that if you look at the strategic picture, we benefit from a stronger India. We benefit from a stronger Brazil. I think we even benefit from a stronger Turkey, despite the, the complexity there. Where the, where the tension comes and where, you know, where I think uh, I'm not as sanguine as Nick that, that it's going to end well is, is, in, is dealing with China. And, and what I'm pessimistic about with China is that if you look historically at, any, at, any, at the situation of a rising power uh, confronting a status quo, a status quo uh, you know, one out of three times it ends in war. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that isn't the case, but that is the real challenge that we face. The, um, let's, we'll come back to China in a second, but I'm, 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 the, 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 even if you don't buy the Kleinist argument, you, you have to acknowledge at this point that uh, there are many places in the world where we have huge interests and very limited sway. I don't know if the gap is more than usual in some of these places, but certainly in places like Egypt it is, in Syria uh, it is. And I wanted to talk about some of these uh, hot spots for a minute. We saw in the, uh, in the news today that uh, Syria, the people of Syria had their worst day uh, yesterday, 180 to 200 people killed by the regime. Uh, uh, we, uh, and not just us, we seem uh, powerless to do anything uh, about this. Is that, a, 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 are we in an unusual situation in, in that regard? Uh, and, and, and let me try to frame a very, very simple question to, to, to all of you is, what should be done, if anything? Well, again, you know, it isn't so long ago, if you go back to the 1990s, uh, when we were confronting a similar situation in Bosnia, there were, you know, thousands of lives being lost, and we seemed you know, unable to do anything, partly because uh, under, the, under the George H.W. Bush administration, and I would say in the first couple of years of the, of the Clinton administration, they didn't want to, just in the same way that right now, I don't think the Obama administration wants to confront this problem, and so it's happening, but we, we've faced these problems in the past. Uh, I think, my, my, my own view is that if we were not in a campaign season right now, uh, with the president pretty convinced that the American people don't want a military intervention at this point, uh, I believe the United States would be doing a great deal more. Uh, after all, the situation is not that, uh, it's harder than Libya, but I don't remember we thought Libya was so easy either. Um, I think that, I think we probably would be taking more action if we weren't in this particular season. Jim, you agree with that? You know, I don't, I don't know whether it's attributable to the political season. I think there's a balance of risks here. I mean, there's a balance of risks. There's a risk that greater intervention will create more chaos in Syria, and there's a risk that, that our failure to do so will also create a tremendous loss of lives and loss of influence, frankly, for the United States and others in the region. My own personal view is we should s resolve that balance in favor of more action. I don't think it should lead to our intervention. I think it would be counterproductive because I think that just as we saw in Libya, the key is to have the United States and Europe in a supporting role with others in the lead. I think the key now is to, to, to put some additional pressure on the neighbors, on Turkey, on the, uh, the Gulf states, to play a more active role, but for us to be more clear that our, our, our objective is regime change in Syria, and that is the goal of the United States and our European partners, and we will work to that end. I don't think it requires U.S. or NATO forces to do that, but we do have to have a more focused and determined uh, goal. Nick, let me, let me uh, I want you to answer that question, but let me, let me frame it a little bit more uh, politically. Um, do you think if we, were, we had a Republican president, if, if Mitt Romney were president right now, we'd be intervening? Because uh, we, were, we were just talking before about um, Mitt Romney's very busy first day as president. I don't know if you've been, been following what, but, but from, my, from, from what I understand, on the first day of his theoretical presidency, he will be uh, sanctioning uh, uh, China, sanctioning Russia, while doing it from the Western Wall. Um, <laughs> And, and, and so, and, and he's been... It's a modern technological Look, look, you can do you anything know, anywhere, can, you know, with, the, with, the, with the little smartphones, you can launch right. whole wars. Um, <laughs> but, but, but do you think that we'd be in a, different, uh, in a different situation if we had a Republican president? Do you think Mitt Romney would actually do anything different? And if, this is part of a broader question about continuity in foreign policy. And the answer is no. And I think that Governor Romney would find it very difficult, given what he said about Russia, that's it, it's our most lethal adversary, and given the threat to sanction China, why have we, have we been successful in Syria? In part, because Russia and China are blocking meaningful action in the Security Council. So we've got to find a way to work with the Russians and Chinese, and it's fine to oppose them where we have to, and we do that most days in American foreign policy. But we also have to engage both countries. Pre, you know, President Obama has a re working relationship developing with President Putin, and of course with Hu Jintao, Governor Romney, if he is elected, is gonna face the reality of foreign policy. You can't walk away from relationships. You can't throw darts at countries 
and expect them to cooperate with you. I think the problem in Syria is very difficult. I'm not sure a Republican administration would have handled it any differently. I served in the George W. Bush administration. Uh, it's infinitely more difficult than Libya. You don't have the Arab League. Blessing, please intervene in the internal affairs of one of our brethren states. They states that's what they said in Libya. You don't have the Euro They're saying it privately, though. They're not saying it privately. Well. And, and you don't have the Security Council support the way you did in Libya. And you don't have the... The Sunni states are certainly not going to be overly ob objecting if the U.S. takes a more active role. And you're never going to get Security Council support again. I mean, the Russians thought the they Russians got burned in Libya. And the no, hardest, the Russians are very unhappy about what happened in And the Libya. hardest thing, Bob, you don't have Security Council support and you don't have the Arab League support. The hardest thing is this is block-to-block -block and street-to-street -street fighting in the Syrian cities. It's not the open desert that was where it was easily, um, easy for us to distinguish between friend and foe. So I actually think the President's been right to be a little bit reluctant to just wade in here. I think Jim's right that we ought to put some pressure, and I'm sure we are, on the Turks, on the Saudis, on the Emiratis to take the lead here. Kofi Annan said this morning, I think you all read it, New York Times and Wall Street Journal, he is more optimistic that he can put a political deal together. I'm not so optimistic. I think we'll be back with these same set of difficult choices in a week but or two But I time. think I, I do, the one thing I, I don't fully agree with Nick on is I don't think this is a question of kind of a military order battle. It's a political question in Syria. And what we need to do is we need to change the balance of expectations among the people around Assad so that they know that the end is going to come sooner or later and that if they want to find a way out, they need to, to get out. Uh, and I think we see some of the defections happening now in the military. The more, the more clear we are in sending our signals about what our objective is, the more that crystallizes the issue for people there. And I think it will ultimately be a political decision among the elites around Assad, particularly the Sunni elites, if they begin to abandon the regime, the, the situation changes. And it's not a question of winning uh, a military battle on the ground. If, if, if you guys were all in the administration right now, what would you tell the, and the President said, what's my number one problem? What would you say it is? Would it be Iran? Would it be checking China? Bob? Well, I mean, there's the number one problem that is the, the big problem of the next two decades, which is China, and then there's the number one problem, which is the big problem of the next year, which is Iran. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that given the way policy works, as you guys know better than I do, the near-term problem would probably uh, swamp the, 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 the long-term problem, although the administration has adjusted to China. But clearly, Iran is the issue that... Uh, do you think Obama's handling Iran well? You know, I don't know whether there is a way to handle Iran well. I, I mean, he certainly has been successful in strengthening the sanctions. Um, I'm just not sure that sanctions at the end of the day are gonna get us where we need to go. And I think the interesting question is whether a second term Obama might ultimately decide to use military force to, uh, to deal with Iran if they, be, if they get close. I know there are some people who uh, are, you know, have worked in the administration who, who say that they think that that's, that's not inconceivable. Jim? I think the, the key um, is whether sanctions work or not, it's been important to keep a broad international consensus together around this because if it ever gets to the point yeah. that Bob uh, identified, which it may, sanctions may not work, the more we've demonstrated that we've pursued all the other alternatives, diplomacy, sanctions, even if people don't support the use of force, there's going to be a greater acceptance of the fact that, that we were driven, we, we hadn't prematurely moved to the other choices. So I think the fact that we've been able to both get an extraordinary response by Europe, I think nobody would have ever anticipated the tough measures that Europe has taken, including a complete cutoff of oil from Iran. And the relatively strong support we've had from even uh, uh, China and Russia has all been from this patient management. Now again, it may not be enough, but I think it's worth having gone through this process so that when and if the choice comes, there'll be a much stronger case to say all the other alternatives were. And I think there'll be substantial European support if it ever comes to that. I think it would be more than people might expect. Um, answer the question of number one problem and then answer this and maybe you guys can do this. By the time I get to Nick, I actually think of better questions. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the question is, and, and I'm using the McCain formulation. You know, John McCain said, a war with Iran would be terrible, Iran with a nuclear weapon would be worse. And I want you to, 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 to break that down and tell us where you, where you fall on that spectrum. Well, I think, I think President Obama has followed a sensible policy. And what, what, what is it? He has said, we're going to try to negotiate with the Iranians. And we're in the third month now of very desultory, problematic talks. But the reality is we have good use of the word desultory, by the way. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> We have, the reality He's is... Like he used to be a spokesman. Yeah, no, he, he was the State Department spokesman. We, su we had breakfast together. We suggested that he just hold forth and we would just no, be I, his Ed McMahons, no. but he didn't no want to do that. No jokes today. No jokes. Um, the reality is, think about what the President's trying to do. 
and there's a high degree of integration between President Bush and President Obama. Uh, President Obama is saying, let's try negotiations because we haven't had a sustained negotiation meaningful with Iran since the Jimmy Carter administration. Think of it that way. So I think he's right to try diplomacy, but here's the problem. If we have another meeting in a couple of weeks and it fails, I know it's going to happen. The President's critics are going to come out and say, well, diplomacy's failed, the President's naive, we've got to give up on that and turn to the military option. Diplomacy requires some patience, especially with a country with, with which we've been divorced for 32 years. We ought to stay at the table the remainder of this year. What he's also done, second thing, is put in place, along with the Europeans, the toughest sanctions ever imposed on Iran. The U.S. Central Bank sanctions actually took effect yesterday. The EU oil embargo kicks in Sunday and Monday. So I would say we've got to give the sanctions a couple of months to see if they are getting, having the right effect. And third, the President, I think, very rightly, as President Bush did, has not taken off the table the possible use of force. And when you're dealing with the Revolutionary Guards, the Supreme Leader of Iran, they're very tough, brutal, cynical people. They understand that. And I think we ought to all thank Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel. He's made the threat of military force real to the Iranians. I think it's helped to get them to the table. Will all this work? Maybe, maybe not. But it's certainly worth trying now than resorting to war in 2012, either by Israel or the United States. So I'm very much in support of what the administration has done. And I was up on Capitol Hill last week talking to a, a group of senators and representatives and was really struck in that bipartisan group um, the degree to which nearly everybody around the table, I thought, was, was supportive of this effort. No reason to turn to force yet. But by the way, and I want to come to you on this, I, it's very hard for me to picture uh, President Obama thanking Prime Minister Netanyahu for anything, but you know, uh, yeah. maybe maybe it's maybe it's happened in in, in private. Surprised. Yeah, maybe it's happened in private. Um, but you haven't answered the question. Which one is worse for you? Oh, I think our I think the right goal is to deny Iran a nuclear weapons capability, and 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 I was surprised and actually really gratified when President Obama spoke to the APAC conference in March, when he clearly took containment off the table. He said, "I'm not willing." Paraphrasing, "I'm not willing to live with a nuclear armed Iran." because of all the different consequences, including other countries in the Middle East deciding they were going to be nuclear powers. So I think that's the right goal to have. We should aim not to live with it, an Iranian nuclear capacity, but actually to deny it one way or the other. Jim, can you live with a, a nuclear Iran? I don't think we should. I mean, I think that, that it, the consequences and the risks are much greater than the risks of, if, if it comes to it, thinking about uh, the alternatives. I mean, I think that the, the problem is, is both the specific problem of the region, which is what happens in the greater Middle East uh, if Iran uh, develops nuclear weapons, because I am quite confident that this won't be the end of the story. Uh, the, the neighbors are not going to live uh, quietly with uh, a nuclear Iran, and it's not just Saudi Arabia. Well, the Saudis will go shopping in Pakistan for nukes, right? I think they've probably figured this out already. Yeah. And I think that Turkey and others, I wouldn't, wouldn't you not underestimate the deep tensions between Turkey and Iran and others. Uh, so I think that the volatility that that creates in the region is, is, is deeply dangerous. And then more broadly, the signal it sends um, that, the, that we've sort of given up on this question of, of nuclear capacity and nuclear proliferation, I think, is one that's, that's not acceptable. The administration has worked hard to try to reduce the salience of nuclear weapons to then sort of acquiesce in this and say, well, anybody who wants to sprint for this is going to have it, I think is deeply consequential. Now, it doesn't at all diminish all the risks and the limitations of what, uh, what the military options would be, but I do not think that a, a strategy that says this is something we can live with is one of so the So the, the panel does not agree with Kenneth Waltz that we should give <laughs> Iran a bomb. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's, uh, that was a, that's not a good idea, generally. <laughs> but, but, but let me ask but you But you get Bob, to be on the cover of foreign relations. You get attention. <laughs> Bob, let me ask you this, though. We lived for, for decades with a nuclear-armed Soviet Union. Yeah. We ultimately triumphed. Their system's gone, our system's here. Soviet Union had thousands of nukes. Uh, they controlled half the world. Um, Iran is, a, by comparison, a pretty measly little country with a, with a regime that probably doesn't have a very long shelf life. I mean, are we just overreacting? I don't think so. And by the way, uh, it wasn't a great thing that the Soviets controlled half the world uh, under their nuclear umbrella. No, but, but patience There were parts of the world that probably weren't very happy about that. And so I would say I don't want to now live, create a situation where we have to live with Iran's nuclear weapon. And by the way, it's not going to be one bomb, right? It's going to be a hundred. Um, that's that's the way these things work. But the larger point, uh, which Jim and, and Nick have already made, is it's not just Iran. Uh, we're talking about you know maybe another half a dozen or more countries getting nuclear weapons, and we may be blowing up the entire you know what's left of the non-proliferation regime altogether. And I really think that. 
may be what President Obama will have on his mind. Uh, because the consequences of that, you know, for better or for worse, uh, you know, you had the nuclear powers during the Cold War keeping a pretty tight grip uh, on the nuclear weapons and not allowing them uh, to proliferate. We're talking about a brand new world. It, it, it may be John Mearsheimer's fantasy, but it's a world where many, many, many countries have nuclear weapons. And the, the other big difference, Jeff, is that the reason that we were able to not have a cascade of proliferation after the Soviets and then the Chinese got the bomb is because we had a nuclear umbrella over Europe and Asia. And they were willing to accept that, and Germany didn't go for the bomb. They, they accepted it. Japan didn't go for the bomb. Uh, South Korea flirted with but didn't go for the bomb. The problem is the Saudis and the Turks are not going to accept the nuclear umbrella from the United States. It's not an acceptable alternative. So the, the they dynamic... They wouldn't accept that because they wouldn't trust us because we allowed Iran to it, go... But there. also we've seen the tensions. I mean, even with the military, U.S. military conventional forces in Saudi Arabia, the idea that the, the, the holy places are being defended by American nuclear weapons is just not going to be acceptable to the Saudi out, yeah. leadership. So we, the, the ability to constrain proliferation, which came from extended deterrence and, and our treaty commitments in the Cold War, is just not available in this context. The neighbors are not, they're going to have to take care of themselves. And that creates a very different dynamic than the one we saw in the... the um, Nick, maybe you can go to this because it's a, it's a fascinating thing. What you, you see on, on the left right now is, is this kind of meme that says, uh, Obama is Bush that, that um, when you look at drone strikes, when you look at uh, his tough line on Iran, people are, are criticizing him from the left wing of his party, saying this guy's foreign policy is not that different from, from George W. Bush's. Do you agree with that? And, 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 and can you also sort of analyze the, the idea in the context of, of continuity between foreign policies of different presidents? I don't agree with that, and, and I guess I should explain. I was a career diplomat, so I served Republican and Democratic administrations, and Jim can certainly speak with far greater authority than I can on President Obama, but my sense is that um, there has been, um, over the last three presidents, a high degree of continuity in foreign policy that you don't see in domestic policy. Um, but there are some clear differences, and, and, and obviously when President Bush left office in 2008, um, we were in a little bit of a hole in certain parts of the world, the Muslim world, certainly Europe, uh, parts of Latin America. I think President Obama has, um, in many ways, restored America's credibility around the world, which is a very good and important thing uh, for our power. Yep, but it, it's Secondly, just, I was oh, just, sorry, sorry. just winding up here, but, uh, Bob, but uh, <laughs> you'll get your chance. Um, and actually, I'm going to cut him off, so you can <laughs> secondly, yeah. secondly, and most importantly, and we're going to get to this at some point yeah. uh, this morning, um, there is a changing leadership dynamic in the world. When Jim and I worked very closely together uh, in the Clinton administration, you know, we must have made 100 trips to Europe because that's where a lot of the power was and that's where the core American allies are. What President Bush and President Obama have tried to do is think of Brazil, of India, certainly China, as part of this new leadership group. And I, what I think President Obama has done well in his management of the G20 and the economic issues. And in now, I think, taking President Bush's policy initially in Iran and really expanding it, he's gotten greater buy-in from some of these powers uh, to, in, a, in essence, coerce Iran through sanctions. He's made some progress that we were not able to make when I served in the George W. Bush administration. I think he deserves credit for that. He's a modern leader, very much part of the 21st century, and I know he's got great credibility in places like Delhi and in Brasilia where we need it uh, for the right. future. But Bob, before you disagree with him, can I disagree with him for one second? Um, <laughs> and just... But I, I spoke first. No, 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 <laughs> but I'm the moderator. <laughs> I paid for this microphone, oh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. metaphorically. <laughs> um, the, um, th there's an irony here. I, I mean, it, it, fine, in Brasilia, maybe they, they, they buy the, they the model of progressive leadership. In Pakistan and, and in Yemen, um, they see President Obama as the sort of king of drone strikes. Uh, I mean, one of the ironies here, and, and you, you bring this up to uh, certain very partisan Republicans on the question, and they don't, they don't buy it, but one of the ironies here is that you have um, uh, the first president of the United States of America with a Muslim name uh, is, is killing, let me be blunt about it, killing Muslims in more different countries than any other president in, in history. We are, we are in active uh, battles, and, and drones are a tool of war. Uh, they're, they're cleaner, so-called, than, than other tools. But we are, we're killing people in four or five different places at, at once. But you and don't disagree with that. You don't disagree with going after Osama bin Laden or al Oh, al well, nice. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. When did you, yeah. when did you, you stop, wait, wait, when did you stop <laughs> disagreeing yeah. about yeah, going yeah, after yeah, Osama yeah. bin Laden? When did you stop beating so what's Osama the bin Laden? What's the yeah. premise yeah. of your question? Yeah. The premise of my question, <laughs> no, the premise of my question is, 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 is obvious. Bin Laden, fine, you know, uh, 
pull them out of the ocean and kill them again. I don't care. Um, but 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 there are but but these these drone strikes that have collateral damage, so called, which is a clean way of saying we're killing innocent people, uh, have have real consequences. And we know in places like Yemen and Pakistan, uh, they are alienating people who otherwise might not be alienated. And by so the, the way, just to add on to that, I mean, as a I love playing the left winger. By the way, as I don't get to do I know it that often. You could yeah. do it again. Steve Clemens will attest to that. As a matter of just measurement, uh, the American standing today is lower in the Muslim world than it was even in the Bush years. And that's, uh, it's true in Turkey, where it's uh, at an all-time low. It's true in Egypt. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not even saying that that, you know, therefore Obama has failed or something. I'm just saying you're just wrong to say that he's repaired relations with the Muslim world. I think we have very complicated relations with the Muslim world, partly because of the reason uh, that Jeff is talking about, but I and think partly for organic reasons that right, do that. Right, exactly, yeah. which is also part of the continuity of American foreign policy. But um, the other thing, though, Nick, is that if you think about what uh, President Obama is doing, it is interesting given what people's impression of him was when he was elected. Now, I think that impression was misplaced, but it was the impression. He is using extremely traditional tools, uh, despite what you say about modern leadership. He's bringing us back to Asia, and what is the most prominent way? I mean, Kirk Campbell laments the fact that this is our most prominent symbol of our return to Asia, is he's opening new bases in Australia. He's promising to shift uh, naval vessels into uh, Asia. And, and the truth is, what countries are still looking for from the United States, I think, is less the attractiveness of our president, the, you know, uh, the way we talk, and still very much based on whether we are able to provide them security or it's, not. But it's bigger than that, because, I mean, the other theme they're looking for, for example, is economic and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is an important well, no, dimension absolutely. of, of the no, policy. Fair so enough. I want to come to the pivot, the, 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 the everlasting you pivot to, to Asia. Well, no, no, he, no, I don't want to stay in the Middle <laughs> East. I'm sick of it. But, uh, <laughs> but I, want you to, I, I, I want you to rebut. If you want to rebut, do you have anybody I'd be you want very to happy to. Mm -hmm. I think okay. you're being very selective when you talk about the Middle East. Talk to Libyans and talk to Tunisians about President Obama. You got to give him some credit for no, having, I'm not, I'm not for having I'm transformed our policy in both places. Nick, I, I, I take it you're coming out of retirement, hopefully in the next Obama term. But um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so well, he's a I'm tough Wait, wait, wait. wait. Well, like Bob Kagan, who has which, no ambition. Which yeah, is exactly. great, by the way. We yeah. used to be friends. Well, I actually yeah. do have no ambition. I already have somebody who works in the government. That's true. But. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that, that, that there's anything necessarily that's Obama-specific that we still have very low popularity ratings Here's in the Muslim Here's the problem. I do, have, I, ha I do have one thing. I've served yeah. in both Republican and Democratic administrations loyally. And I think that when Republicans see an American president, a Democratic president, um, essentially undertake the kind of very tough-minded counterterrorism policies that President Obama has, he deserves a little bit of credit. It'll be very difficult for Governor Romney to run to his right on these issues, and that's going to be unusual in American politics. Well, that's an excellent political point, but I am Thank giving Obama credit. I do give him credit. <laughs> I'm just talking about the irony that Jeff raised at the beginning of the question, uh, when a long time ago, when he first asked this question, <laughs> which, which is... It was like Tuesday, right, or whatever, yeah. It which is like that you have a Barack Obama, and I think this is a, a winning point, and that's why they're doing it, saying, look how many people I kill every day. Um, you did not, well, give it to the New York Times. This is specifically how I do the targeting. You know, they, they are making it an issue in the campaign, which, you know, that's what presidents do. I'm just saying that is not, and, I, and I'm, I'm pleased about it, okay? But I'm saying that is not what people expected when well, they elected I, Barack but, but, Obama. But I just, I think it's important to say, though, and, and you did say it earlier, it may be that people had different expectations, but the president was clear in the campaign. He said Afghanistan was the real, the, the important mm -hmm. war, and that, that he identified, he was the one who said explicitly that he was not going to respect Pakistani sovereignty if it came to an opportunity right. to deal with this. So, I, I mean, the, the, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I think it's important to answer Jeff's question from the left about it, the, if there's a disappointment. It's because they weren't listening, I think, to candidates. The left Obama. should always have been disappointed. <laughs> the, right. that, that'd be true. Um, by the way, in phase two of the Secretary of State tryouts, we're going to go to the bathing suit and then the talent competition. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which really, stick around. I mean, really. Why, stick, watching stick around. an audience stick, flood stick out around, the No, room. stick around yeah. for that, because that's going to be great. We're bringing Richard Haas in. Everybody's coming. It's going to be fantastic. Um, the, uh, I, 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 
this is a fascinating conversation on, 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 on many levels. And one of them is that this is what always happens in foreign policy conversations, which is we, 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 we stay, no matter what we do, I mean, I would love to talk about our special relationship with Bolivia, obviously, <laughs> uh, at great length, but we never get to do that because we have the same problem set. You know, you have Iran, you have Yemen, you have Pakistan, you have the Middle East peace process, which we haven't even touched on. Uh, but the Obama administration, has said very specifically and is doing things actually to pivot toward Asia, to deal with the long term, I, I suppose part of the motivation, to deal with this long term issue of a rising China. And, and I want to talk about that pivot if it's, if it's working or not, or if you, and this gets back to that, that, that core point, which is that presidents want to do all sorts of interesting things to advance American interests and advance global peace, but they get stuck dealing with a dysfunctional Pakistani government, for instance. I mean, are we going to be able to to make that pivot, or does the it's it's like the Godfather? Every time you know, every time you try to get out, they pull you back in, and that's what you have well, in think, the greater Middle I East. Mean, first of all, I think you know that one of the great lessons is you got to be able to do more than one thing at once while you're president and running the administration. But second, on Asia, I mean, I do think the president from his day one signaled the importance that he was going to attach to Asia. I mean, for the first head of state that he uh, invited to the White House was the Japanese Prime Minister at the time. Secretary of State's first trip as Secretary of State was to Asia. The, one of the first policy decisions we made was to sign the so-called Treaty of Amity and Cooperation with ASEAN, the Southeast Asian countries, that allowed us to join the uh, East Asian Summit, which is something that had been resisted in the past. So the President, I think, early on identifies sort of a long-term set of interests that to, whether you call it a pivot, rebalancing, it's to demonstrate that the United States sees critical long-term interest, economic security, political interest in Asia. And that, very importantly, and if you, you have to listen to the President's words on this, that this is not a contained China strategy. This is an engagement strategy in East Asia. It's a reassurance strategy out of the conviction that you're going to get a better result in China by knowing that the United States is there, that countries can rely on the United States being there, and it creates a climate in which, as China thinks about its choices, it's more likely to uh, develop a cooperative strategy. This is something that I don't think has gotten lost in the day-to-day -day of dealing with the Pakistans and the Syrians. It's been a sustained effort that started at the beginning of the administration and has continued right up to the present. Nick, will you talk about rebalancing a little bit? I was just going to say, I think there's two problems with the word pivot. One is, obviously, we've, we're the global leader. We've got to be involved every, every, in every continent of the world, uh, most notably Latin America, Africa, Europe, not just Asia. Pardon? And Antarctica. Very important. And Antarctica. Um, second, pivot was a problem for a lot of people around the world because first, what the Europeans heard was, you're pivoting away from us, your historic ally towards Asia. I mean, the, the administration is now using the word rebalancing. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, that we ought to be building up because that's where China and Japan and India are in, in Asia. Those are going to be critical allies for us. I, so I agree with the stationing of Marines in Darwin, the use of Anderson Air Force Base as a strategic hub in the Pacific, much the way that Ramstein is in Europe, is very smart. Um, the, the problem here is, is China. I, I agree that we ought to be engaging China. There are very few people I think would say we could contain them. But it's engaged, comma, hedge. There is a hedge to this policy. And the administration may not want to say it for obvious reasons, but part of it is we don't trust China long term and Chinese intentions long term. So establishing a military partnership with India, reinforcing the alliances in Asia, makes a lot of sense for the United States going forward. You know, I, I, the problem with the, the word hedge is that it, it begins, as you begin to prepare for the worst case, you begin to make it self-fulfilling. And of course, we can't know what China's choices are going to make. But as soon as we begin to say, well, we need all these capabilities that are going to make sure that if they go in the wrong direction, we're ready to meet them, they in turn see this through the same lens and they say, well, the United States is prepared to keep us down. And one has to take China's own history seriously, the, the, dec the century of humiliation, the sense of weakness and vulnerability. We need a new paradigm here. It should not be Pollyannish about China. We don't know how it's going to come out. We don't even know internally what China will look like in 10 or 20 years. So we shouldn't assume the best. But on the other hand, preparing for the worst tends to make the worst the greatest danger. So we need a new approach. We need an approach that, that challenges China to demonstrate that its intentions are in line with what its rhetoric is. It, it likes to get away with the idea that it says, oh, just trust us, peaceful rise. We shouldn't trust them because they say it, but we should say, here are the things that you need to do to reassure us, to reassure your neighbors. And if you do that, we can have this kind of cooperative relationship. Bob, any thoughts? Well, we can say whatever we want and call what we're doing whatever we want to call it. I can, I'm very confident what the Chinese see is containment. And when they see us strengthening our military relationship with India, when they see us 
uh, shifting uh, naval vessels from the Atlantic to the Pacific uh, when they see us doing uh, more and more na joint naval exercises now with Korea and the Yellow Sea, uh, it's, in, it's inconceivable that they would not see that as containment. Now, I actually think there's nothing wrong with a policy which basically says to the Chinese, the idea of acquiring military hegemony in this region is a non-starter. Pursue your economic glory, pursue, you know, f solve the many, many problems in China, uh, but the notion that you are going to say these waters are ours is just the wrong way to go. And I think it's very helpful of us, actually, to steer China uh, in a different direction. But that's, that's starting about the political intentions, and the bigger problem, in my view, is, is, is trying to deal with the fact that China will have a more capable military. It will. I mean, any country that has the capacity to do it and to protect its national security is going to take that. So the challenge for us is to accept the fact that China's military is going to be more capable and to challenge them to do it in a way that's not threatening to us and to others. That's the kind of dialogue that traditionally doesn't take place, but needs to take place, because that is going to determine whether we have rivalry and potentially conflict in East Asia or not. But I think strategic mistrust is, un, uh, it may be unfortunate or not unfortunate, is a reality in the relationship. There is going to be strategic mistrust. And there was a very interesting, you probably saw the, the little pamphlet put out by Ken Lieberthal in Wang Ji Shou, which, which is about, you know, strategic mistrust and, uh, you know, both trying to reflect how China and the United States look at each other. I think it's an inescapable reality, and managing it is, is going to be the but test. It is, it is managing it and, and understanding that we both have a stake in limiting the risks there and to identify the places where the mistrust is most likely to lead to conflict right. and trying to bound that. Right. And I would say there's going to be rivalry and there's going to be strategic mistrust. We should just assume that. Um, we got to try to work with China and keep the peace with China, but it's easy to do that from a position of strength. So this buildup, and Bob referred to it, we've had a 50-50 split historically in our naval forces since the Second World War, Atlantic and Pacific. And Secretary Panetta just announced it's going to be 60-40 now, 60 percent of our naval forces in, um, in the Pacific. And none of the reductions in U.S. military spending and enforced structure will come out of Asia. They'll come out of other, other theaters. I think this is very sensible. And there ought to be a high degree of bipartisanship, I would think, on this policy. But this gets to, an, I mean, getting back to the rebalancing question. Uh, we are not going to be withdrawing from the Middle East. I mean, that just, right. we, to we, that are, idea, we are right. deep, I would say in some respects, we may be more deeply enmeshed in the Middle East in the years to come than we have in the past, precisely because of all the ferment uh, that is taking place there. And we're not going to shift away from the Middle East. And this is going to now, and we haven't talked about this, but this is going to get into resource questions. Because we simply, uh, it, it is not yet clear to me that we're going to be able to make the rebalancing real for instance, if we go into uh, se sequestration of the defense budget, which is looming over everybody's right. head. But it's can, also, can, I, mean, yeah. I, I think, you know, I, I mean, I agree we have important strategic stakes in the Middle East, but I think we also should not underestimate the fragility of the, the, the basis for our presence there. I mean, our, our presence is based in the Gulf monarchies, right? How long are they going to be there? How reliable is that? And I think this is one of the big long-term challenges for the United States. Are we going to be able to sustain that footprint uh, in the Middle East. It's in our interest to do so. We need to find it, but there are deep tensions there, as we've seen in Bahrain over the last two years. Um, and, and this is going to be increasing problems for sure. the United States. Uh, we're going to go to questions in a few minutes, I, I think, um, I've five minutes. Um, but I want to just, let's just cover Middle East peace in five minutes if we can. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, so, so uh, why, why has the administration failed to bring about what President Obama wanted to bring about, which was a comprehensive Palestinian-Israeli peace? Nick? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I think, you know, looking at the Obama foreign policy objectively, this is the one issue where there's been absolutely no progress. And if I'm sure if the Obama team could replay the spring of 2009, the open challenge to Israel, the public disputes with Israel, they'd probably do that. Um, there is an opportunity, I think, uh, perhaps in 2013 for either Governor Romney or President Obama reelected to take this up again, and I think we ought to do it. Um, the challenge to the Palestinians How would you is, do it differently? The challenge to the Palestinians is they're fundamentally divided, and I fear that the Mohammed Morsi presidency in Egypt might embolden Hamas to think that it doesn't have to compromise uh, with Abu Mazen in Ramallah, with the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah. The problem with the Israeli government is, well, the strength of the Israeli government is that this new constitution that now includes Shaul Mofaz as deputy prime minister does have the domestic strength to make some big decisions. They need to see that there's a united Palestinian delegation. It's never easy. It's been 64 years since this problem began. Every administration has tried. 
I don't think this administration has done well, but they may have a second chance if the president is reelected and they ought to take it. Jim? You know, I, I would emphasize the point that Nick made about the, the challenges on the Palestinian side. I mean, I think we cannot continue to believe that the peace process is going to proceed in 2013 the way it did the 20 years before. The, the Arab Spring does make a difference. The world has changed in the region. And until some of these things are sorted out, the kind of conventional notion that that the Israeli Prime Minister and the, the PA Prime Minister or President can sit down and cut a deal are just not true. And so there is going to have to be a resolution on the Palestinian side and some kind of consensus between Fatah, Hamas, and, and the other forces on the Palestinian side that makes it possible to even imagine what a negotiation is like. In the meantime, what needs to go on is the, the, the FIAD plan, which is to continue to develop the capacity and, and to not expect negotiations either driven by the United States or driven by the two parties. They're not ripe right now, and you cannot make a negotiation happen when it's not ripe. Just a kind of a coup de main, kind of forcing it out of Washington. Everybody thinks that can happen. If only somebody would punish somebody or threaten somebody, this would happen. The parties have to be in a position to make a deal, and right now, with the uncertainties, especially on the Palestinian side, but to some extent on the Israeli side as well, that's just not going to happen in the near term. Bob, a answer the question and, 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 and fold this one in. Uh, we're talking about things coming down the road for American foreign policy. Do you think that the Camp David Accord between Egypt and Israel is in trouble? Because yeah. that will change everything. Well, I'm not sure. I don't know what it would change, actually. I mean, I'm not, there's not going to be a war between Israel and Egypt. Uh, but I would say, uh, I would, you know, the more democratic Egypt is, the greater the likelihood that, that a parla an Egyptian parliament could vote. Now, it's also possible for a variety of reasons, and I, and I want to be as optimistic as, you know, as reasonable, uh, that, that, that the Brotherhood may decide that's not the step they want to take right now, that that's not beneficial to their economic interests. It's, it would create a crisis, obviously, with the United States, which, you know, they don't like the United States very much, but I think they re realize their dependency. But I think we have to look at the, at the very realistic possibility that if you let popular will in Egypt actually express itself, I think that might be where it would go. But I'm not sure what the actual consequence of that is. And let me just say one final thing. When we were looking well, at Well, how the, could Jordan possibly keep its peace treaty if it's the only Arab well, state? With we, a peace treaty with Israel. These, all these peace treaties, it seems to me, were built around a notion of eventually getting a, a global Arab peace with Israel. We are a, a long way from, it's been a while since anybody thought that was a really, really serious true. possibility. And, I'm, and I also wonder about how un unbelievably vital it is, especially in part because of what's going on right now. And one question I would have is, what is the effect actually, including on this issue, of Assad falling uh, to another kind of government. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know whether it's good or bad, but the, it will have real impact on what's going on in Lebanon, and it will have real impact on what's going on in the Palestinian Well, the territory. more instability surrounding Israel, the less likely Israel is going to make some bold withdrawal. But it could also under, it could weaken certain forces that are now strengthened by Syria. Also true. Uh, do you want to finish that up? I'm just going to say a lot we'll depends on, this, on the very dramatic events happening in Egypt. Sure. Um, the fact is that there's, a, you know, there's going to be a struggle for power between the military leaders and the new Muslim Brotherhood dominated government. And there are at least some indications this week that they are talking and they may be compromising with each other. I can't see an Egyptian government where the military has influence walking away from the Camp David Accords. And it, it, I think it'd be very consequential if they did. Very bad news for Israel. And the US has a role to play here. We're not the central actor, but we do have our aid, $1.3 billion a year. And, and we ought to, behind the scenes, quietly, make it clear to both sides in this struggle that the Camp David Accords are critical for us. And depending on how that comes out, it has a big influence within the Palestinian side, because after all, Hamas is now out of Syria, kind of thinking about moving to Egypt. If the Brotherhood finds a way to live with this, that could have an influence on the Palestinians as well, not on Fatah, which is where Egypt normally had its influence, but ironically on the other side. Let me tell you, I don't yeah. like the idea of putting all our money on the Egyptian military for a variety of reasons that, that worries me. Um, we're going to go to questions. Um, there are mics uh, there and there. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, if you just wait for the mic because we're recording this for posterity or something. <laughs> I don't know why. And make your questions in the form of a question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Antoine van Akmaal. Uh, there are three factors that I haven't heard you talk about that I wanted your opinion on in terms of whether they are strategically important. One, shale gas, and how it makes the U.S. more energy independent and the Middle East, particularly the Gulf, less relevant. Second. You get one question. I'm sorry, we got so many people. Okay, Answer the energy question if you can. 
So you know, I think the, 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 the big thing about, as you know well, it's not a question of whether we're independent. It's a question of what does the global energy system look like? And I do think this is significant. It's shale gas, it's a lot of the new uh, technologies, it's the availability of LNG and, and the more uh, globalization and commodification of gas that allows us, the, the world system, to be less dependent on any one region. And I think that's clearly a plus in every respect. I think that the, part of what we've been able to do with Iran is a function of the fact that people see the energy environment changing, the leverage of the producers is declining. So I think broader than just shale gas, but the, the diversification of the global energy supply over the long term, coal, modern coal, cheaper, cleaner coal, all of these things is a hugely positive uh, benefit, I think, for, for our strategic situation and our strategic flexibility. And it affects Russia, too, obviously. Yeah. I'd also say it doesn't, it doesn't lead me to believe that we can somehow just consign the Middle East to secondary importance, because we've, Israel's there. Israel's always going to be there. Egypt's there, the keystone state. So it may give us a higher degree of independence, particularly from the Gulf states. It doesn't really lessen the strategic importance of the region, in my mind because of these other two countries that are so important to us for other reasons. I thought Pennsylvania was the keystone state. <laughs> Egypt. Oh, Egypt also, that's great. It's on their license plate. Uh, I didn't have the license plate, yeah. really? <laughs> yes, sir. Brief in the mic, yeah. Uh, you've made it through the hour without mentioning the name of the Secretary of uh, State at all. I wonder if you'd give us a... Um... I did, just for the record, so my former boss knows, I talked about her first trip to Asia. <laughs> but you didn't mention her name. And, and the question is... Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton. Okay? Yes, thank you. Uh, now, the question really is, uh, how, uh, what kind of a report card could you give on her, her role in the administration's foreign policy and comparative to other past secretaries Well, let's ask her State. former deputy for an honest assessment. A, a or, plus. <laughs> or the person who's married to her spokesman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Bob's married to her spokesman, so, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Okay, I, Nick. Nick Burns is a lifelong enemy. to work so in the next easy, yeah. the Obama term. Yeah. So and my wife works for her also, by the way, but we'll, we'll put that aside. Wow. Next question. Yeah, no. I'm the only, I'm the only and here she is. Thank you, Hillary, for coming. You know, you know. I'm the only person in this, in this panel with no ties to this administration. I'll answer your question. Um, you know, I think what she's, she's done a lot of things extraordinarily well. I, her early emphasis, as Jim said, on Asia was important as a signal of changing U.S. priorities. Second, um, if you look at where she travels um, and, and what she does in those countries, typically when we all worked for secretaries of state, you'd fly into the capital city and only the capital city. I remember Secretary Clinton's first trip to India in the summer of 2009. I think she spent two and a half days outside the capital. And she's focusing on, of course she's focusing on war and peace and balance of power issues, but she's focusing on the role of women. She's focusing on development. She's lifted up development within the Department of State and made it a bigger priority. I think this is a pretty important contribution uh, that she's made. So I've been very impressed by what she's done. Bob, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, go over there, and then I'll come around here. I'm sorry. Right here. Yes, ma'am, in the blue shirt. Um, just on the question of China, I would like to know what you think. They own so much of our debt. How does that affect our leverage with them, against them? Well, let me, Don't all jump one, at the, once, yeah. one of the mistakes I thought that Secretary Clinton did make was when she said it's difficult to um, to say no to your banker. Um, because I actually don't believe that, uh, it's unclear to me what leverage that gives the Chinese. It seems to me it also gives us leverage over them. There's a, I don't know, I have enough money to know this is true, but apparently if you owe a bank a hundred dollars, you're in trouble. If you owe the bank a hundred million dollars, the bank's in trouble. So I, I'm assuming that, <laughs> I wouldn't know what that actually means, but uh, I'm assuming, I'm assuming there's an element I'll of that. I'll bet you $10,000 you do. I think the bottom, <laughs> the bottom line is the, our economies are so mutually dependent that China has no interest in destroying the American economy. So I, you know, it's unfortunate. I would like to lower it significantly, but I'm not sure what, maybe Jim has, a, I don't know whether Jim has a different view. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think this is a situation that they hold their debt because it's in their interest. It's in their interest for that, the value of that debt to remain uh, valuable to them. And they need the American economy to succeed. Their whole economy depends on our economy. So I think this is one in which this is as much their dependence on us and the fact that they're holding the debt just deepens that dependence. Um, the, the woman in the white uh, raising her hand, yes. Wait, wait for the mic. I think we have time for two more, two uh, more. Okay, uh, my name is Sonia Lee from Chinese People's Friendship Association with Foreign Countries. And in fact, more than 20 years ago, I studied in the States. And then when I returned work to China, and I feel shocked. I use shocked 
definite. I mean, 20 years ago and now big change. However, from uh, from um, uh, economic viewpoint, there are GDP and the export input number big. Seems like a threat. However, please remember if divided by the 1.3 billion people, number immediately shrank small. And then uh, from a military viewpoint, there is no single military, you know, or military base outside China. So I want to ask from what, uh, or which aspect China is a threat? Thank you. I would just say that I, I think there's a consensus in both of our political parties that we ought to do everything we can to get along with China and work with it. We're going to be the two most important countries, most powerful at least, in the 21st century. There's no question from our perspective that China is the most important relationship that we have. You'll see a lot of emphasis on China. But I'll, you know, from my own perspective as a practicing diplomat, um, we've been concerned by Chinese actions in the South China Sea. We have treaty allies. Uh, some of the disputants, the Spratly Islands disputes, for instance, we have obligations there. We have an interest in seeing problems worked out, not by bullying. Uh, and sometimes China can be accused of bullying its neighbors, but more by consensual means, you know, negotiations. Secondly, China has not played by the rules on intellectual property rights. Third, we have profound disagreements with the Chinese government on human rights, religious rights. And so um, we've got to be honest about the differences. And what you're seeing is, in our democratic society, people not holding back and people trying to move the relationship forward in an honest way, and I think that's what you're going to see in the future as well. Quickly. Bob? Um, I think we have time for one more. Is there anybody back? Yeah, there's somebody all the way. Yes. The room extends. I'm sorry. When you talked about uh, China earlier, it was really couched in the military sense, the rebalancing, all that. It seems to me one of the most important things, maybe more important than the military, is our commercial relationship and not only with China, but through Asia. China will obviously uh, dominate the Asian economies economically, uh, and, and what are we doing to ensure that we're part of that, that we're a player out there, that they're successful and that we're successful uh, economically in that region? Well, one answer is the, the Korean uh, Free Trade Agreement. I was just in Seoul a few weeks ago, and uh, you know, the relationship with Korea now is so good that the people in the embassy are saying it can only go downhill from here. And uh, you know, with, that's a that's a foreign that's a, service. That's a, that's, that's a good foreign service. That's a declining mentality. Things, yeah. yeah. But uh, no, I mean, I think that that, that free trade agreement uh, has made a big difference. And the administration, oh, Jim can talk to this uh, more than I can. But the administration is making an effort uh, with uh, with the TP with the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership uh, and other means to you know to try to get the United States back in the game. I don't think anyone imagines that the United States is going to. To, you know, displace China or 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 beat China in this respect, but the United States definitely can be in the game, and it is important. And I know that you know, the State Department uh, worries that there's too much emphasis on the military and not enough on the economic and the diplomatic, and that's what they're trying to re repair. The 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 TPP, the Trans-Pacific uh, Strategic Partnership, is extremely important not only because it it potentially puts the United States at the center of building a multilateral trading regime in East Asia, but it's also what we would call a high quality agreement. It protects intellectual property rights. It deals with some of the issues of labor and environment that we care about. And so this is a model that really allows not just the United States as a trading partner there, but it actually to influence the rules of the road. And it has huge attraction. More and more countries want to be part of it. Mexico and Canada have now signed up to be part of this. Japan is thinking about becoming part of it. So we are actually now becoming the center of the, uh, the economic architecture of East Asia if this is successful and it's moving forward in a good way. Similarly on investment treaties. We finally cleared the way to make more progress on bilateral investment treaties, which is also really good for American firms at moving into these markets. So I think you're right. This is a critically important area, and we want to make sure it's not a China-centric model of, of trade relations. Uh, Nick, you're the last word. Um, last word on this. Um, it's been difficult, I think, for President um, Clinton, President Bush, and President Obama to juggle these competing priorities with China. And um, President Clinton, I remember saying um, in his second term, the problem's not going to be a strong China. It may be a weak China. And this gets back to a point that a couple of us have made. There's a, there's a symbiotic relationship that we've got economically with the Chinese. And we are the two leading actors in the world. And so in some ways, and you see this in the hedge, and you see this in the US military buildup, we've got to position ourselves to be powerful in case the Chinese revolution goes the wrong way. But in the main, I would expect us to have a 
a very close, not friendly perhaps, but close relationship with China, working out differences because we are in effect the stewards of global stability more than any two countries. This is a new thing for us and very difficult to get this the balance right. But I do think there's a high degree of um, uniformity among the last three presidents and how to look at the Chinese challenge. Thank you very much, guys. This has been great. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it very much. Thank you.